I think it, probably too much blame attached to China. It's certainly true that in terms of what happened at Copenhagen, Chinese participation was perhaps unhelpful. But I think that uh, in retrospect, it's pretty clear that there was not much chance of the kind of outcome that many of us wanted from Copenhagen. And indeed that the, the US position was probably in the long term even less helpful. China had done a great deal in advance of Copenhagen in terms of its national appropriate mitigation actions, in terms even of its transparency. And um, it, it is unrealistic to expect a Chinese leader to negotiate on the hoof because Chinese policy is the product of a carefully built coalition of interests internally. And it, it's just not possible for any one leader, however powerful he looks from the outside, to change that unilaterally. In fact, there are people in China who argue for binding mitigation targets, and they argue uh, that this is really in, in, in China's best interests, because if you have targets, you drive the kind of efficiencies in your economy that China certainly needs, and you drive the transition to a green economy, which is part of China's national ambition. However, uh, there are also people in China who feel that this is a constraint on China's growth and on China's right to grow, um, and for the time being, they certainly will prevail. I think one of the difficulties that China has is that although the policy proclaimed at the centre is, is signed up to Kyoto, is signed up to the transition to a low carbon technology, this is quite difficult to implement in such a large country with huge disparities in prosperity between the East Coast and the Inland Provinces. So you can close down a dirty factory in Guangzhou and it opens up again further west because the provincial governor wants it. A national framework, of course, would help to address that. Um, but I think we're, we're a little way off that. What we can envisage, and they have begun to talk about the date at which they expect Chinese emissions to peak and begin to come down. That's not binding targets, but that, that at least is a, is a, a vision of a, of, a, of a graph that we could applaud. It is dependent on coal, but if you look at the, and they do indeed famously continue to build coal-fired power stations, but if you look at those power stations as opposed to the ones that they are also closing down, uh, the new ones are much cleaner, they're all supercritical, they're closing down a lot of very dirty plants. Um, they are probably one of the world leaders in what's called clean coal technology, always relatively clean coal technology. Um, and they are very keen on joint projects to develop carbon capture and storage. So, you know, we don't know what will come of any of those technologies, but you can be rest assured that China is keenly interested, not just because they have a coal problem and a climate change problem, but also because strategically they want to command these new technologies. They want to be the leaders in the technologies of the future. And that's um, a strategic economic shift for them. So that is absolutely fundamental. Uh, to national policy. Um, it should also be recognised that they've made big investments in renewables. They are one of the world's leading powers in wind, one of the leading um, powers in solar, and that this will continue.